Hello everyone, this is Yasemin Çetinel. I'm with you today as the host of this SCL Talks episode uh, on behalf of SCL Turkey, of course. We will be elaborating a very hot topic, uh, claims after COVID, proving your delay and money claim. I'm joined today by a very distinguished colleague of ours, Nicholas Gold. Nicholas is a partner at Fennec Elliott involved in construction law and construction disputes globally. So Nicholas, thank you very much for taking your time today and joining us for our short talk. Uh, without further ado, I will pass the floor to you on our topic and perhaps with a question. Why do you think uh, this topic bears importance? Let's start with that. Okay, well, um, COVID claims are a pretty hot topic and they have been for 18 months. But um, I think most people have been looking at this in, in, in terms of whether COVID could be um, a valid claim under a construction contract. And that's really all that people have been considering. And um, uh, the first questions are whether there's a notice, you know, whether a notice needs to be given, and it most usually does, because especially given the benchmark of the FIDIC contracts. Um, and, and this is really what's been debated for months and months. And it seems to me that, that only more recently have people started to think about what it really means to actually have a COVID claim. Because just because you have COVID in your country doesn't mean that actually you, you, you've you got a valid claim for time or money at all under your contract. Well, a very good introduction indeed. Then um, perhaps taking it from there, can I ask you, do you spot any difference between civil and uh, common law countries in that respect? Yeah, so that's a, it's an interesting question, really, because um, we've been looking at lots of different countries around the world under FIDIC or, or EPC contracts in relation to the, the COVID story that's gone on. Um, and um, of course, there is a, a, a the obvious difference is, is that the common law um, has a fairly strict application in, in terms of what the words on the contract mean and the, the, the requirement of notices. Civil law countries actually you find a you know pretty strict as well, but there might be some slight nuances in 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 um, the ability to seek relief for force majeure type events. But the actually the, the reality is that every country tells a different story, uh, and um, you can't just draw a clear distinction between a civil law country and a common law country. You've got no choice but to look at the facts of a particular country. So, for example, in England. Um, it was the 23rd of March 2020 when lockdown commenced. And if you all remember back at that point in time, we didn't know much about COVID. You know, no one was really stuck at home at that point. We were all seeing it as something in the news. And um, But a lockdown started in England, so restrictions by the government on travelling and the ability to go out. 23rd of March, Monday, then two days later, the housing minister said, if you're on a construction project, you should continue to work. They realised that actually the claims could be very substantial and they couldn't stop what is the largest employer um, in every developed country, the construction industry, from, from working. So you get that, that factual kind of run of events. If you looked at the United Arab Emirates, a few days before all this, on the 19th of March, they suspended uh, visas. Uh, and they suspended work permits and they imposed night curfews a week later. So this did have a direct impact on construction projects. So it's the facts that you have to look at. It's not just a case of it being in the news. When has something happened that actually impacts on your on your labor flow or your project? Yes, and indeed, you know, there is a repetitive uh, concept that comes at the table very often. Uh, I'm sure that you come across to it very often. You mentioned it as well. Uh, we hear force majeure, force majeure, force majeure. So do you think it's uh, the only uh, resort available for the parties? Is COVID a force majeure? No, not, not at all. It's, and again, it's very interesting that most people are, seem to be just focusing on force majeure. We have plenty of clients and, and there are plenty of talks about force majeure. And it seems the obvious one. And again, if you look at the standard FIDIC wording, clause 19.1 in, in the older red 1999 red book, and um, there are those four um, requirements for an exceptional event or circumstance. First of all, beyond um, a party's control, which a party could not have provided for before entering into the contract and then 
which having arisen a third point um, could not reasonably be avoided or overcome. And then finally, which is not substantially attributable to either party, and this is a classic force majeure event, Fiddick then goes on to give you some examples, and, and interestingly, natural catastrophes is one of the examples, but it includes earthquake, hurricane, typhoon, volcanic activity. It doesn't seem to quite fit the pandemic mode, but it clearly fits within the four exceptional events. So you find yourself quite easily being drawn down that pathway, but of course it only gives you relief for uh, time. That does seem quite fair, doesn't it? Because it's not really the contractor's fault, but it's not, not really the employer's fault. Um, but having said that, of course, the other avenue would be to consider um, a change in law. Yes. So again, first of all, FIDIC 13, clause 13, 7, yeah, again, the red book, looking at the red book, you know, a change in law um, that could easily be a change in law made after the base date. Um, and um, some countries have uh, introduced legislation dealing with this area. And of course, the benefit of a change in law is it's time and money and extension of time and money. It's actually quite difficult to argue. You look back at the few examples I was giving you, is it a change in law to introduce a curfew? Perhaps that's a power the government already had. And there's lots of arguments about, about that. But um, also it's worth having a look at um, clause 8.4 in FIDIC because that provides an extension of time for unforeseeable shortages of personnel or goods caused by an epidemic or government actions. So you're squarely within that. Uh, and um, uh, the, there's nothing really said about money, but but if you're entitled to an extension of time under that event, and there's, there's no um, uh, cap on financial claims in the contract, then it seems to me that you could you could make a financial claim off the back of, of that. And, and that's certainly something something to consider. Um, uh, and um, there is also clause 8.5 not, not looked at very much. Um, this is where the contract has diligently followed procedures laid down by the relevant legal, legally constituted public authorities. And then there's a disruption or something happens, which, which changes the process. Seems to me, again, we're very much in that territory in many countries. So it's worth having a look at other parts of a FIDIC contract beyond force majeure and indeed your particular contracts that you have be careful of amendments though of course well very very useful remarks uh, to be very honest from my side and perhaps a very short sum up point uh, would you like to have any practical consideration as to how do you prove your delay claim and money claim for a COVID related event yeah sure now this is the tricky bit this is the bit that everybody seems to be forgetting so you have an event you, 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 you it's disrupted your project you think because you know, you haven't got enough people on site, materials are short and so on. But what's the difference between that and perhaps your own inability to progress the works? So I always think, um, you know, you need to look at the cause and event uh, that, that's going on with your claim. But here, you know, these golden rules for an essential claim are, are really sort of clear. And I think there's four. You know, what is the cause? Well, it's not COVID, is it? The, the real event is the inability for people to get to site because uh, of a curfew. So you need to demonstrate how many people you would have had coming to site and that you really had them coming. It's not just a theoretical idea. And then the effect, well, the fact they've not got there meant that you are 100 people down from your workforce or whatever it might be. And then the entitlement, well, the calculation of, of, of the... Um, sorry, not the calculation, the, um, the relevant provision in the contract which gives you a right to time and maybe money because of that cause and effect. And then finally, the last bit is your substantiation. So the, you know, the calculation of how much you've really lost. Um, and actually when you look at, you know, say the last 18 months um, and the actual impact of different events, you find that you're really looking at a week at a time or several days, people couldn't come to site or some of the workforce uh, some of the workforce couldn't work efficiently because of social distancing. Materials didn't arrive because they were, uh, uh, there wasn't enough drivers in a different country or, or, or close by to get the materials to site. So you have to break your COVID claim down into lots of little stories. Otherwise, it, it just doesn't work. So, you know, the, the claims I'm looking at at the moment seem to be lacking that. But, but having said that, I've had some adjudications and some DABs now in relation to this area. And, and, and you know, it, it can be done and it, and it does work. Thank you very much. And I think that con concludes the uh, short talk uh, with a simple records, records, records remark from your side. <laughs>
on how to substantiate the claim. Thank you very much, Nicholas, for being with us today. Thanks a lot, Yasmin. It's been a real pleasure.